Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benu. You're watching Israeli News Live. Real quick, before we get into uh, this, evening, this evening's broadcast here, let me just remind those of you that, uh, that uh, do enjoy listening to our broadcast, whether it be our news broadcast, prophetic insights, etc. Uh, your support and what we do is, is desperately needed, and we do greatly appreciate uh, your contribution. You can go to our website, israelinewslive.org, place you can donate there, a little button you can click on there, or israelreturns.com. And at the end of the broadcast, if you prefer to do that by mail, our mailing address is there as well. Let's get right into this news broadcast, though, this evening. It's very, a uh, little bit little bit lengthy here. I'm going to be sharing with you here in just a few moments here an interview that I did with Dr. Roddy Brown. Uh, Roddy's, uh, by the way, his doctor degree is in law, uh, but he is an incredible uh, man on uh, biblical insight, uh, you know, archaeology, etc. Not that he is an archaeologist, but uh, he has some just impeccable insight. I sat down with him uh, in Jerusalem recently, and we discussed the Temple Mount. Uh, and especially, it could not be at a better time to share this broadcast with you in light of the news that keeps coming up, UNESCO set to vote again on whether Jerusalem is Jewish or Muslim. And let me just share this with you, friends. I may get a little upset with my, with my people, with the government there, on some of the things that we get involved in as a nation. Uh, you know, I, I feel that's my duty, that if, we're, if we do something that's not right, that we have to call it out. Um, but when it comes to whether or not Jerusalem is Jewish or not, whether the Temple Mount was where the first and second temples actually sat, even the Dome of the Rock, it was not even built as a mosque. It was actually built as a prayer house for the Jewish people. Uh, that's something that a lot of people are not aware of. But at any rate there, uh, I am 100% for my people and that this land here that we live in, that we have returned home to, is the biblical land of the Jewish people. Uh, and when it comes to the, the, the Temple Mount, etc., yes, I do believe this is where the third temple set. Now, I am concerned about, or excuse me, first and second temple set. I am very concerned, though, about the possibility of the third temple going up. Not that I would be against the third temple. Wouldn't be against it at all, but I am against the relationship that Rome has with Israel and, th and their move on trying to build a third temple. And this is why you see such a major move of people like UNESCO voting again whether Jerusalem is Jewish or Muslim. Because the Catholic Church has come up strong with a small people according to Daniel's vision in chapter 11 there. That small people is the Palestinians. But he only does it after he signs this, this, uh, this covenant that he signs. It's not actually called a covenant. I believe it's, it's got a different term in, in the... In the um, in the context in Daniel's prophecy there, uh, a league. It's actually a league that he signs with the people there. The league that he signed was with the Jewish Congress on the Nostra Aetate, and that was the bunch of backslidden rabbis that do not stand for the true uh, nature and true love of Israel. And those backslidden rabbis signed in a document that was unifying the Catholic Church with the Jews, and now the Rome is trying to bring in the Mekodesh, which we were exposing there in Israel recently. And Mekodesh basically is a Hebrew word and is used as an adjective, means to engage or to espouse. They're trying to marry the vision. That vision, of course, is the reconciliation that only the Messiah himself can do with the Jewish people. There will be no reconciliation with the Pope of Rome. No, nope, God, that's Edom, and God will bring judgment on Edom when it comes down to who Edom is. Uh, so anyway, the article, just a little brief on this, following the passing of a continuous resolu resolution denying any Jewish connection to the Temple Mount or the Western World in Jerusalem, another body within the United Nations Educational, Cultural, and Scientific Organization, UNESCO, is set to vote on a similar statement declaring the sites holy to Muslims alone. It's absurd. And let me just say this to, to, to the, my friends that, that listen to this broadcast that are Arabic. Uh, many of you may, or, I know there's many of you that are even Muslims that watch this broadcast. You know, I'll stand with you when, when, when what the West is doing in Syria and the evils that are being done to you there, you know, the evils that even get done towards, you know, the Palestinians. But I also know that the Catholic Church incites the Palestinians to violence. And then on the other hand, then the Israelis 
uh, react to that. And it's a constant conflict back and forth. And I'm trying to get people to wake up to realize, you know, that one, Palestinians need to realize that it's the, it's the Catholic Church igniting the violence. I mean, Jean-Louis Tron, what does he do? He says there'll be no peace in Jerusalem until the, until the uh, autonomy, basically, of the, of the holy sites is dealt with. In other words, until you hand everything over to the Catholic Church. That's exactly what they want. You don't believe it? Let me share with you what a, a, a quote that was, or a comment that was posted on one of our videos recently uh, says right here, we Catholics will, will build a new Vatican high upon the Temple Mount. There the Pope will mark every faithful Christian with the seal of righteousness. Without that mark, you cannot be raptured, but will be thrown into the bottomless pit of eternal hell. Are you serious? I mean, I, I, let me tell you something. Yeah, I believe the Pope is going to try to do that. You know why? I saw it in the vision. God showed me. He said, there's a man drinking upon my holy mountain. I was on Mount Zion. And God showed me. He wrote it on a rock put it in like an amber fire, just wrote it on a rock in front of me. And before I went to pray there on Mount Zion, I heard this sh singing and stuff going on over towards the Temple Mount. And for some reason, God had revealed to my heart, they'd built the temple, but it wasn't for the Jewish people. It was for the Catholic Church is who it was for. And it was for a, an interfaith gathering thing is what it was for. That's what they built it for. And I knew that. And then suddenly on this rock appears this writing in an amber fire, fire that says, there's a man drinking on my, my holy mountain. And then it went away and another writing came across there. You're to remove him. And I'm like, I, I, I'm nobody. But you know, I get up, I look around and sure enough, I find this guy, evil looking guy. He turns around, he's got a chalice in his hand like the Pope does when he does his communion. And he looks at me and he pours it out right in front of me. And he says, I'm not drinking anymore. Yeah, you know what? That was written in Obadiah. God says that they will drink upon my holy mountain. I think it's verse 16. He says, and that was masculine plural when it speaks there. So it's men only. And the Pope, when he came in 2014, it was only men that drank upon uh, right there in the upper room there above King David's tomb. And I wouldn't have an issue with that. But then what do they do? They come back to like a week or so later and they do another communion, but they throw all the Jews out of, out of, the, out of King David's tomb. You see, now the Jews respect the fact that the, 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 the church has a place for Christians to come to the upper room above the tomb of David. I don't say there's not controversy here and there, but they've respected that. But did the Catholic Church have a right to come in there and throw the Jews? Who, and who gave that order to throw the Jews out of the tomb of David? They removed all of them from the tomb of David so you could do a communion service inside the tomb of David. Then it was gender inclusive. Men and women and from all nations, all churches came in there. Yeah, that's exactly what you did. And you know you did. And so when we see statements like this here, I know that's what they're coming to. That's exactly what they're coming to. You know, I saw a picture in France one time, and I'll share it with you. I'm going to be putting it in a video here before too long here. And when I saw this picture here, now no doubt the, the guy is probably considered a Catholic priest, but it looks so much like an Orthodox Jewish guy kissing a nun. And when I saw that, it reminded me of the Mekodeshit thing that was going on in Israel here that we went there and exposed not long ago. Trying to marry the vision. You're trying to marry the Jews, the Orthodox community with the Catholic Church. It'll never work. God's prophet told you it would fail. Anyway, let's get in here. Let's take a look at the, uh, I want to share with you what Roddy says. We talked about the Temple Mount. Incredible evidence uh, to show that the temple sat on the Temple Mount. Not like Bob Cranook says over there, uh, or you know, over here on some place over there in, in, in the old city of David. That's what replacement theology is all about. They want to take it away from the Jews. The same thing with this article about UNESCO. It's replacement theology. And my Muslim friends, Arabic uh, friends, I just say to you, I call you friends. You know, I remember the covenant that Israel made. Our father Jacob made with Laban. Laban was called a Syrian. And he even says, he knows he had other gods. He served other gods. But they made a covenant of peace between one another. And that's what we should have even today. A covenant of peace. If you want to serve other gods, that's, you have a right to do that. That's up to you. But we're going to serve the God of Israel. 
And we respect it. Okay, God, God even told us when we were coming into the land of Israel, He said the Moabites, okay, don't war against, uh, against them. I've given them that land. Ishmael's children that were up in there, all right, don't war against them. I've given them that land. That's, that's not the whole country of Jordan, but, you know, you have to kind of, actually what was given to Israel is over the Jordan River, a little further over to the east, right? So get on over there to where it belongs, and that, you know, we should, we should respect that. We should respect the Saudis and their land, their integrity. Respect the Syrians. That land does belong to them. Damascus was their capital. Have respect to that. Barack Obama, you should have respect to President Bashar al-Assad in the land that he has. Now, the only thing I'm asking as well, to my Arabic friends as well, do you not know that the historical fact that when they built the Dome of the Rock, it was never built as a mosque. It was built as a prayer, a house of prayer for the Jewish people. That's what the man that designed it for and built it for. All right? Now, granted, it should be the third temple sitting there. And it should be a house of prayer for all nations. But you know, they said that when they go to build the third temple, even if they build alongside the Dome of the Rock, they said it'll cause, it'll cause riots throughout the world. Well, I can see why. You know why? Because it won't be the Messiah bringing it. It'll be the Pope of Rome bringing it. Sure, it'll cause conflict. But you know, if it was done the right way, it, it'd bring peace. Let's take a look at what Roddy had to say here with this interview. God bless you. Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and today we have with us Dr. Roddy Brown. I know Roddy doesn't like to be called Dr. Roddy Brown very, very much, but uh, he does have his doctorate degree. And we're going to be speaking about some very fascinating facts that uh, Roddy has here uh, in regards to uh, the Temple Mount. I know there's a big dispute, uh, especially more since uh, Bob Kronuk has come out with his book, uh, his latest book there about the Temple Mount, suggesting that it is not the actual site where uh, the temple once stood. And then we also have Ken Klein, who also has done a documentary. I do know both of them, uh, I would say, as more of an acquaintance, but I've spoken to both of these men by phone before on different other issues, not on the Temple Mount. Well, Ken Klein, yes, on the Temple Mount itself, uh, who wanted to share with me his find before he made it public. Uh, and although I have looked into the objective side of this, I, like, like uh, Dr. Brown here, do not agree with the uh, findings of Ken Klein uh, or that of Bob Cornuke. Not to say that they're not maybe trying to do this from a good heart and, and faithful at heart in what they're trying to do, but today we want to take the time, and I want Roddy to share with you guys what he has, uh, the, the facts that he knows of from the different scholars that have worked on this, that know the, the source, the water sources for the, uh, the Temple Mount, and then indeed where the Dome of the Rock sits today was where the first and second temples actually sat years ago. Roddy, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Steve. Wow. <clears throat> okay, the issue of the temple. Why are you and I sitting here having this discussion today? It begins in uh, 1994. You have a Dr. Ernest Martin who writes a book, and I think it was the, the Lost Temples or the temples that the Jews forgot. The Jews forgot where their temples were. <clears throat> so why are we even discussing this? If you talk with theologians, archaeologists, historians, the experts, they're not even going to have a discussion with you. It's something that, that's a foregone conclusion. Um, they're just going to laugh. But what has happened since Dr. Martin's book, since Ken Klein, since Bob Cardinuk's book has come out, and since he has been endorsed by Chuck Missler, you have a few million Christians who are being led, deceived in the wrong direction. And how is that? Okay. Where the Dome of the Rock sits today is the Temple Mount. It's 35 square acres up there. Um, that location is the traditional place of Solomon's Temple, Zerubbabel's Temple from the book of Haggai. 400 years later, you have Herod and the Romans. They come in, and Herod builds his temple that Flavius Josephus says, if you've never seen Herod's temple, you've never seen a beautiful building. Now, 2,000 years later, supposedly this is not the place. But what sits up there today is a monument, a shrine to Islam. And if we take 
that premise, and the premise is from Islam that the Jews were never there, which means if the Jews weren't there, Yeshua wasn't there, Jesus. If he wasn't there, Christianity wasn't there. And now you have a new form of replacement theology. It's replacement theology repackaged. And if the Christians are deceived and accept this, then they too are being replaced, not just the Jews this time. So it becomes a really big issue. <clears throat> okay, so let's go through the, the arguments of Dr. Martin, Ken Klein, Barb Cardinuk. The first arguments are going to be that the Jews forgot where their temple was. The second big one is going to be that they're the water source, um, the needs for the slaughtering of the animals on top of the temple, um, pursuant to Leviticus 1 through 11, that there's not enough water up there. And then a third um, premise of Carnuke's book is going to be that the 35 square acres was the um, Roman encampment, that that's where they were at. And Ken Klein also goes to that same uh, premise that it was a uh, Roman encampment All right. uh, for the Roman soldiers. And that's, uh, of course, they're trying to use as well, Roddy, they're trying to use some of the uh, the, the recordings, I forget which, uh, which uh, you, you'll know that better than I will, but you know, trying to say that when the, I don't know if it's Josephus or who it was that came in that documents that this was there or that was there, uh, but the main issue it really comes down to it is the water source. And that's what seems to make everyone believe that Mount Zion was some huge mountain that was tore down and it filled in the Temple Mount area. And, uh, and of course, yet they're unearthing more and more even north of the city of David, more ruins that are still low down. So if the mountain was there, they built it on top of the city itself. Okay, you brought up a lot of good points there. First, let's start with this concept of Zion. Um, I like to go to Scripture. What I recommend for your viewers to do is to Google Zion and the book of Psalms. And you're going to come up with an endless amount of information. But some of the key ones are going to be Psalms 2, 6, where God says this is his holy mountain. All right? Then we've got Psalm 132, 13. It will be the habitation. God will inhabit it. This is where he will live. We've got Psalm 48, 1. Um, this is God's holy mountain, his holy mountain. Then we have Psalm 48, um, verse number 2. This is where Mount Zion is to the north of the city. So what city is this? This is today, it's Ir David, the city of David. We know where this is at. That is not in dispute. You can look at any map that you want to on the internet to see where it's at. And it is a very low elevation at a 60 degree angle going up towards the Temple Mount. Now underneath this Temple Mount, this Temple Mount is a false platform with four walls that go around it that are artificial walls. The Herod likes to build everything really big. And the mountain is like this. So in order to build big, Herod, has to make it flat. And that's what we see today. Yes. We don't really care about what's up there. We care about Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah that's underneath. This is where Abraham takes Isaac. Um, so let's first talk about did the Jews forget where their temples were? So we have Solomon's temple, and it gets built, and then it gets destroyed in 776, 777. Then we are exiled for 70 years. We're only gone for 70 years. We come back, and Zerubbabel is given money by Cyrus to build temple number two. That temple stands as the second temple period until the Romans get here in 62 B.C. When Herod comes, he wants to make it extravagant, go back to what Solomon had. So he has to make the temple mount flat, and he, um, he doesn't destroy Zerubbabel's temple. He is allowed to build a wall, take it down. In essence, he refurbishes it and then expands it to make, as Josephus says, one of the most beautiful buildings in the Roman Empire. Then in the year 70, the Romans come and they systematically tear the city apart. But then the Romans still continue to hang out. We have Hadrian in the year 135, Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba is back on the Temple Mount. They are trying to retake it where their temple was. 
So then the next big event that's going to happen is going to be the Byzantines. When Constantine gets here in the year 313, Constantine's premise at the Council of Nicaea, Nicene is that we must replace everything of those reprehensible Jews. So what does he do with the Temple Mount? What do the first Christians do? I know you all aren't going to like this, but he turns it into a trash dump for the next 300 years. But during this time period, that's the only time that I can even suggest that these guys are suggesting that the Jews would have forgotten. But the problem is we have lots of history, archaeological evidence of the Jewish people, the remnant always being here. In particular, the Jews once a year, even if we weren't allowed to come back into Jerusalem, would gather on the Mount of Olives. During Tishbiav, this is the day of the destruction of the temples, and they would lament over from the Mount of Olives, looking at the Temple Mount. Then, isn't that just like David? Isn't it just like uh, Yeshua, Jesus Himself? I mean, uh, and I mean, the Olivet I did not, Discourse. I, that, that's, it's fascinating to me because if you think about it, and I just did the uh, the Mystery of David video on that, and, and how David, like Jesus, was there weeping over Jerusalem. Having and I did not know the historical side of that that they would come on Tishbeav and actually sit on the Mount of Olives and weep over uh, the destruction of the temple. And the thing is that there's your prophecy when Yeshua says your your house will be left to you desolate until you say, "Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord." There you go. This is so. Then let's move to the archaeology. <clears throat> you can go all around Jerusalem, whether it be in Abu Tor. Um, whether it be on Mount Scopus, whether it be on the Mount of Olives, whether it be on the Hill of the Evil Council, we always have these remnants of Jews that are here. These Jews are not going to forget where their temple is. They're praying towards it three times per day forever, even till today. This concept, this thought process, or even an argument that the Jews have forgotten is ludicrous. What you, and I want to go back, it, it almost becomes uh, a heretic statement to say that we have taken the house of God where our creator lived, because what's the purpose of the temple? God says, build it and he will dwell, dwell yes. live, Shekinah glory. He would walk over 35 different ways our creator says he will live there. Yes. Then he takes his Ten Commandments. Moses has them in a box, the Ark of the Covenant. It's kept where? In the temple. That's right, in the Holy right? of Holies. Abraham. Abraham is told to, Abraham is so faithful. Imunah, he is so faithful that God imputes righteousness. God's, he's the only person God says is his best friend in the Bible or his friend. He has Abraham take him to Mount Moriah as an offering. Then we've got the next carrier character. Hamilic David, King David, he buys the threshing floor from Ornan after he captures the city of David, right? And this is where he goes north of the city. Then we have Solomon. Now, David has a temple. David, excuse me, David has a tabernacle. It's a portable tabernacle. And what's it covered in? Skins. It's covered in skins. That goes to another issue that we can talk about later if you wish. Why are we looking we'll for a... Yeah, why are we looking for a permanent... Um, stone structure when maybe we if we are the temple maybe we should be looking for something that's portable and covered in skin like David's tabernacle and the tabernacle in the wilderness either way David has a tabernacle in the city of David now first Kings chapter 8 if you'll go and read that when Solomon gets ready to build or has already built the first temple what does that chapter say it says that Solomon takes the Ark of the Covenant out of the city. If he's taking it out of the city, then the, the uh, Solomon's temple can't be there. Where is it? It's to the north, as the, all these book of Psalms keeps talking about. So this concept of the Jews forgetting where their temple is, um, I hate to use such a strong word, but it's ludicrous. Now let's get into the other two arguments, water um, and the Roman encampment, and we're going to talk about archaeology for this. Uh, we can use just plain common sense because one of the things that Bob seems to give his credibility upon is that he's a, a really good investigator. So the people that are out there looking at this, go do some investigation yourself and let's look at the water sources around Jerusalem. 
everything in Israel is porous rock except for the Jordan River. So it rains quite a bit here in this country, and when it rains, what happens to the water? It goes through the rock underground. We have endless water resources here. Let me, let me just throw something in here, Roddy, that okay. you're bringing up, the, the water source. Uh, this is something that I discovered yesterday uh, over here, not far from the, the tomb of David. And uh, this is where, uh, the, very close to, uh, to the far corner there outside of Mount Zion's gate, coming up the hill from, him, uh, from Hinnom, Hinnom Valley there, uh, you can come up from the bottom, and as you come up and you're getting right up here, as today they call it Mount Zion, uh, but as you're coming up there, I found an actual ancient mikvah. And this is outside of what archaeologists have noted, at least one archaeologist that I've noticed on one website that notes that uh, next to the Protestant cemetery is what they believe to be the Essene Gate. Right. But the point I wanted to make, though, the mikvah is the only one I have seen in Israel that is actually active. The water, as you say, the porous rock, the water is there. It's full. It's used by the Orthodox community. And it was right outside the gate where they go inside, where St. James, actually, even after the, uh, the 70 AD revolt, comes back later, the brother of Jesus, and actually has uh, their own gathering there on this mountain up until, I forget what year it was, like around 130, 135, until the Barcova re revolt itself. Right. So, yes, and, and I bring this up because... We're, we're just now coming into the season where we start to get rain from the dry summer months, and the thing is still full of water. Yep. So as you say. Where is it coming from? It's always it's in the rock. The right. It's in the rock. And so the, this concept of the living water is another key thing that I think that Cardinal misses. Um, you need to understand what the rabbinical and the Jewish concept of living water in is. It has to come from the heavens or a natural spring, and it has to be continuously free-flowing. All right, so up on the Temple Mount, up on Mount Moriah, underneath this false platform of Herod, we, uh, we see a few areas that they can collect rainwater. But what these investigators didn't do was some simple archaeological history that we've known about since 1872 only. There's a, uh, a person named Conrad Schick. Um, he was here in Jerusalem from 1846 until 1901. He became the city engineer and architect under Islam. Even though he is a Christian missionary to us Jews, uh, Islam hired him as the city engineer and architect. Now, if you go to the Israeli Museum today, they have a special exhibition on three of the biblical fathers of archaeology. One of them is Petrie. He's very well known in Egyptology. Then you have a guy named Saucy, and then you have Conrad Schick. Archaeology is a destructive science. You have to destroy the one level that you're looking at before you get to the next. And if you don't scientifically preserve what you're destroying, the height, the weights, the distances, the volumes, every single thing about it, then you've lost that forever trying to get to the next level. Conrad Schick begins this process. Now, Conrad Schick, while he is a Christian missionary to the Jews, the Jews also loved him. He designs and builds the first Orthodox neighborhood outside the walls of Jerusalem in 2,000 years. It's called Meshirim. It's still there today. The Sultan, not only did he hire him to become the city architect and engineer, but he hires him to be the only non-Muslim to ever go underneath this artificial platform that Herod builds. He builds models. This is what Schick does. Instead of pictures and videos, he builds these models. They are puzzles. They're Barbie doll houses. They come apart. One of those models here in Jerusalem, I have free access to quite often. All of the archaeologists, from Gabrielle Barkai, Shimon Gibson, Dan Bahat, David Amit, these are the true Indiana Joneses in this scientific field. Yes. These guys they know about this model. And that model, what it does is it shows over 39 cisterns that are on top of Mount Moriah and a few of them on top of the platform. Now, there is no question about water being a non-issue. Water is a non-issue. We have two aqueducts that come from Hebron. The upper aqueduct would come up to 
um, around what's called Migdal David, the uh, Tower of David. That's Herod's Palace right. um, to Mamilla Pool area. But the lower aqueduct, it goes to the temple itself. It predates the Romans. That aqueduct actually touches Mount Moriah. We can, you can go online, type in um, aqueduct that, that touches the, the temple mount, and you can actually see a picture of some of what's left today. That's before the Romans get here, before Herod builds it. Why is there an aqueduct going to the Temple Mount? Because they're carrying water to all of these mikvah oats that are up there, all these cisterns. Now, you've got other archaeologists. One of them's name is uh, Lean um, Rittenmeyer. He has verified one of the cisterns that's up there. It's on the southern end of it. That one cistern alone holds over 2 million gallons of water. The issue of water is a non-issue up there. And the other thing too, Roddy, that, you've, that we've discussed before, because some people might think, okay, you have water, but how do you get the water there? Uh, and I have been, in, from an aerial point of view, uh, even up here, uh, not far from uh, David Citadel, which is not really David's, nothing to do with David, it's just what they call the David Citadel by the Jaffa Gate, I have been high enough here to where you can see uh, all the way where Roddy's talking about the, the up there by the cemetery there, the, the huge uh, water uh, reservoir. The Mamilla Pool. Mamilla Pool. You and I went there. Yes, we've been there all the way down to the Jaffa Gate. You can see the fall. I literally, from the camera, we filmed it. You're, you'll see it here on, the, on this, uh, this video here. The elevation fall. The elevation fall. And even from Jaffa Gate, people have no idea how huge huge of a drop it is so in the in the uh fr from a standpoint of water pressure especially like in alabama we build the water tower we pump the water up there so that you have the pressure to come down so it blows out your faucet they had the water pressure we're in the judea mountains the judean hills we have constantly up and down everyone here is a mountain goat up and down up and down so this issue of water is not an issue but let's just throw a few more things in there on the north end of mount moriah what we don't see today is Bethesda Valley. There were, you have the Bethesda pools that are spoken of in the Gospels. This is where Yeshua goes, and he tells the crippled man to pick up his mat and walk. We can go. When you come on a tour here, you will go to St. Anne's Church. You will see the yes. Bethesda pools. These things are humongous. They were full of water, and that is to the north and at a higher elevation than the Temple Mount. All that water is flowing down to the Temple Mount. Then, when you go to the Western Wall Tunnel Tours, when you come out of the Tunnel Tours, what do you end up at? These really big cisterns that we only see half of it. The other half is at the Sisters of Zion, uh, what do they call that thing? Not a monastery, but a convent. Convent, yes. All right? These things constantly fill up. If they empty them to clean them and get the artifacts out, what happens? They fill right back up. Why? because there's a constant flow of water. There's going to be other springs that are there. Then we have the prophecy that's in Ezekiel that's going to talk about a spring that comes, that bursts so much from Mount Moriah that it flows to the Dead Sea, brings it to life, and flows all the way to the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Again, water is not an issue, but it has tried to be uh, presented as an issue. It's misleading. Okay, the next issue is going to be the Temple Mount as uh, where the Romans were at. Again, anybody who would do a proper investigation, no matter how small of an investigation, all around Jerusalem are these camps. They're Roman camps. They hold 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 soldiers. The most Romans, all the historians, archaeologists, these experts, there was never more than 16 or 17,000 Romans all at one time. Right. But we have the camps as far away as Machnehuda, which is the, the Hebrew shuk, our Jewish shuk up there, and the bus station. We have the factory for the 10th Roman Legion. There's three or 4,000 Romans there. You have Mount Scopus. There's a humongous camp there. There's the Mount of Olives with the large camp, the Hill of Evil Council where the United Nations is, Abu Tor. <clears throat> That's about 12,000 all the way around Jerusalem. Why are they on the outside? Because just like today, 
everybody lives outside the old city and you come into the city to work. Okay, so if anybody who does just a minimum, uh, minimal amount of investigation, they are going to see that the Romans are all around the city and they're not living on top of this Temple Mount. Okay, Steve, let's, uh, let's go do some, some basic archaeology history. You can pull this stuff up online and get even, even uh, I don't know, a 15-year-old, a 10-year-old doing a minimal amount of investigation can find this information out. Um, so, at the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount, when everybody comes to visit, there is a stone, a really large stone, and it's called the trumpet stone. That stone is too big to have been moved unless it fell from the top of the temple. That stone is the one that's blown on Shabbat and for all the high holy days for the Jewish people. Right. Right? It's found at the southwest corner of the temple mount. Now the distance between there and the bottom of the city of David is approximately, I don't know, almost a mile, maybe more, and at a 60 degree angle coming up. I just don't think anybody's moved that stone that far in order to try to misguide us on where the temple was. Um, then we've got all the dressing stones that are all around the Temple Mount that's there today. One of the dressing stones that's my favorite is going to be, um, it says Huda, the Huda Gates. They're very beautiful. Now, what are the Huda Gates? This is on the southern end of the Temple Mount. There's three arches. Everybody can see them. You can pull pictures up on the internet. What are those gates? Before the Jews, before we would go to the Temple Mount, we had to do a ritual purification. Yes. And in order to let everyone know that we were now ritually purified, don't defile us, don't get near us, don't touch us, we had to enter through these gates. That's right. There's no other way for us to enter. We couldn't enter from the east or from the north or from the west. We had to go through these gates. Now, if the Roman soldiers were up on top of that Temple Mount, did they build the Huda gates for themselves to come through? Or did they want all the Jews to do a ritual purification and come hang out with them? There's no other purpose for the Huda gates other than a Jewish purpose of doing a ritual purification and coming up to make the offering and the prayers to the Lord. Right. All, right? all the mikvahs that are out there as well. Right, that's a great point, because right there at those are over a hundred mikvah oat, all right? Exactly. Now, these mikvah oat were for rich people, because down at the bottom of the city of David, we have the Gihon Spring and the Pool of Shalom, where Yeshua heals the blind man. He tells him yes. to wipe the mud away. Why is he down at the bottom? Because the rich people don't want to have to walk that mile up to the top of the temple and be sweaty and dirty and defile themselves. If you're rich, you take a mikvah, and then you go straight into the Huda gates with your goat, man, yep. right? Yep. Yeshua, who does he hang out with? All of us poor Jews. We're going to have to slap it all the way up that long walkway. Okay, These, this is just basic archaeological evidence that we have that's all over the city. Um, if, if okay. you, let me just say this. If you come here to Israel, you can look up Roddy when you come or just get in touch with me. I'll get you hooked up with him. You can go. He'll go much deeper into what you're hearing now. We're just we're trying. Of course, it's late. We've lost daylight already. We do have lights up going here, but we're trying to give you a crash course on what's going on uh, to show you that the Temple Mount is the Temple Mount. This is not. This is it's another case, Roddy, of replacement theology. Of replacement that theology. You have said many times before. Yes. And uh, now we get the Muslim prayers going as well. But uh, but. We don't want replacement theology, and that's what's going to happen when they go to build the third temple. Uh, they're going to compromise. They're not going to build it on top of the spot where the Dome of the Rock is. They're going to compromise. They're going to build it off to the side uh, in line with the western or the eastern gate that has been put up there by the Ottoman Turks. Yep. Uh, well, they'll make, they'll make Erdogan happy. All right, so let's get through some of this before the prayers get too loud going on here. There's about an hour and a half for the discussion here. I'm just going to lay out as quick as I can just the basic archaeology things. One key issue is there's an archaeologist, world-renowned in the city of David. His name is Eli Shukran. Uh, Karnuki quotes him quite often. But if you come here and you go and find Eli Shukran, and you can do that, you can call him. He takes people on tours. You can ask him specifically 
is it his opinion that the temple was not on the Temple Mount, he's going to tell you that that is ludicrous. Okay, this is, this is absolutely nuts. But this book misleads you into believing that that's Ellie's position. Go online, type in Ellie Shukran, the largest cistern ever found. You will see a video from the year 2013. On the southwest corner where we find the trumpet mount, Ellie discovers the largest Jewish cistern around. And where is it at? Right next to the Temple Mount. What does Ellie specifically quote the purpose of that cistern is for? It's for water to be used on top of the temple. Yes. Maybe not living water, but you've got thousands of animals being ritually slaughtered that they have to clean it with. Ellie, the, the misleading uh, quotes in, in this book, I can't believe they hadn't even brought a lawsuit. Maybe maybe she'd give my colleagues a call. I don't know. You can call Ellie and ask him yourself. Um, and that happens quite frequently as well. I've seen it before where uh, people will take, and uh, there was a documentary done uh, on, uh, about uh, basically replacement theology. They use a bunch of Jews from the Holocaust, uh, and they have no idea what the documentary is really about, and then later they find out that it's totally on something else. So oh, it, it does happen quite often. And it's, a sa it's sad because then people are thinking that these people have credibilities, they have, they, they have the credentials, uh, of what they're saying, but they're misquoted, and then the world's deceived into believing a lie. And what does Yeshua say? Don't be deceived. That's right. Yes, wars, rumors of wars, disease, poverty, and pestilence, those are signs, but they've been in every generation. The key thing that Yeshua focuses on is don't be deceived and the falling away. And for me, this is just another example. Something else that's really of the utmost importance in 1999 under the area known as the Solomon Stables. Now, Solomon did not build it. No horses were kept there. Other than that, the name is perfect. That's not my quote. That's, uh, that's Gabriel Barkay's. But the, uh, the walk, they dubbed for over four days with bulldozers. Now, Dr. Barkay says that a toothbrush would have been too big of a tool to excavate that area over 10 lifetimes. They used bulldozers. The dirt has been protected um, since about the year 2001 by the Israeli Antiquities Authority. It's a sifting project, like you sift for gold up in the mountains. You go there, you pay 15 shekels, they give you two buckets of dirt, you get to sift and you're looking for six important things. Most of the time it's gonna be coin and coins and pottery, um, maybe bones, maybe the bulli that they are finding constantly. They have found over a half a million perfectly intact artifacts that are dated from Iron Age 1 and Iron Age 2. This is the time of King Solomon and King David where all of these artifacts slide down the hill over the period of time throughout, throughout all the destructions. <clears throat> okay, um, just a couple more points I want to bring up. The other one is the, the signs of the temple itself the Jews were allowed to place a sign that said, do not cross this threshold under, or your death would be of your own causation. All right? It's a warning of, of, of pain of death if you came into this holy spot for Jews only. They find this artifact on top of the Temple Mount. Now, this was, find, was found. You can go and research yourself. There's not one of those signs. There's two and three of these signs found on top of the current modern day Temple Mount. If it's not there, why is it going to be up there? It just it doesn't make any sense. It's just common, basic, investigatory results. And this is written and conclusions. Of course in Hebrew. Is that correct, or was it written in Aramaic? What language was it written in? Actually, I think that they would have uh, just like the sign um, that they put on Yeshua's cross. I think they have all three languages. Wow. We, we can, and tell you the truth, I haven't looked at those in a while, so uh, we can, it, they're gonna, it's going to be a warning to non-Jews. We'll put it on here. We'll find it and put it on the film as you watch it. There you go. And it, it would have been a warning to non-Jews, so it's probably not in uh, Hebrew or Aramaic. It's probably in Greek. Okay. All right. Um, all right, here's the big one. Not one stone shall be left standing upon another. Yeshua says that. Everyone, go read your scripture really carefully. Who is he talking to? 
what did they just get through doing and where are they sitting and what are they looking at? And look at all four Gospels, all right, because uh, some of them are a little bit different. Yeshua is talking about the temple. He doesn't care about these artificial Roman walls that are around this area. That's right. All right. And what's the biggest evidence that not one stone is left standing upon another? <clears throat> By law, everybody is allowed to go on the Temple Mount. But the ultra-Orthodox Jews don't go up there. Why don't they go up there? They don't want to defile potential holy ground. Exactly. Which means there's not, if there was even one stone left on that Temple Mount, I guarantee you the ultra-Orthodox would find a way to get up there to be able to pray there. They, but they don't. Where do they pray? That's Outside the at the Western Wall at the Kotel. Because they don't know. There's not one stone left standing of the temple itself. And they are our biggest credibility that Yeshua's prophecy came true. He is not talking about these Roman walls. Right. Has nothing to do with the platform whatsoever. <clears throat> then the, there's another 10 or 15 points that we can bring up. We can do this all day long. Um, just people, open your eyes. Do not be deceived. You, you must wake up. That's exactly right. Righty, I thank you very much for being able to take Thanks the time. Thanks for having to, me. Thanks to, for giving me the opportunity. Just to get a little bit. And, and I can tell you for a fact, what Roddy has said is just an overview on this. We'll have to come back with him and really take some time to go into this more. Um, and this and, is hour 11 of 10 hours of talking today. Exactly. So out. he is worn out. But uh, it's, it's some very important information, and I think it needs to be brought out publicly uh, because I have watched this uh, since, uh, for me, it was since Ken Klein first brought it to my attention and sent this to me uh, quite a few years ago, sent me the documentary before he made it public, asked me if I'd look at it, give, give him my thoughts on it. Uh, and then Bob Cornuke, right after that, then he does his book, which is kind of odd that he does that. But uh, yes. Bob just has a little bit more uh, influence, and of course Chuck Missler. I know Chuck; we filmed together before. Uh, and if either one of those two, Chuck Missler or Bob Carnuk, if you would like to discuss this on film, all these issues and all the other ones I have, um, I'll be more than happy to do that with you sure. at any point in time. And be not glad only to. Me, I, I got a feeling there's a few other true experts that who would like to voice their opinion too. I think it'd be great to do it, and if, if so, if, if anyone happens to know, I mean, I know Chuck myself, but Chuck's getting pretty pretty much up in age now, uh, but Bob or anybody, if you want to sit down and just as brothers have a debate on this, we would love to make it public, and we can come and film it and uh, sit down with some of the experts and share with the world, because what we want to know is what the truth is, and not just supposedly. Uh, and I know that Ken, when he, when I talked to him, Ken was really concerned about the water source. Right. And in, in Roddy didn't even mention the, the pipe system that was discovered that they used to be able to bring the water all the way from Hebron coming down here. It was a really elaborate water system that was built. It's basic archaeology. Ken's mm -hmm. been here. He knows, he knows about this water up there. This is the problem that I have with these guys. They know this information and they're not sharing it. They're writing books to make a buck. And I have been underground. I have seen the, at least up from the Jaffa Gate side here, the huge aqueducts that are here. I've been over here to the Pool of Bethesda. I have seen the huge water there. I've been underneath uh, the underground tour there where the huge water source is there on the north side of the Temple Mount. And believe me, if you've got all that water, Roddy, all the way back up to Hebron, and that's a good distance there with that much, and it's what, is a 100 meter drop, I believe it is? Something like that. 100 meters, guys, is a long way. That's like having a huge water tower right here on the Temple Mount with, with tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of water, uh, all that pressure coming down. You could have the size of a, of a fire hydrant out there, and if and you uncapped did. The it, did. it would blow it out. And one last thing, Roddy, I just want to mention there, uh, just because it's, it's incredible to think about, as Rabbi Orly said, that the temple was laid out like the human body. And we know that that trough that took all the bloods, blood and guts and stuff out the side of the temple there that would be washed down to the Kidron right. Valley, uh, that water, when it came up, it was just like Yeshua when he laid on the cross, when his side was pierced, blood and water comes wow, out, and blood and water 
was being washed out of the temple, showing that he was indeed the final sacrifice. Brother, thank you. God bless you, brother. Okay. God bless, God bless you. you. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, give a, write us if you if you enjoyed this here. If you're coming to Jerusalem, we'll get you in touch with Roddy Brown, Dr. Roddy Brown. Thank you. I trust it's been a blessing for you in watching this uh, broadcast here. And uh, again, we just remind you and thank you for those of you that want to support the work that we do here at Israeli News Live, the prophetic broadcast, the things that we're doing, and also in Danun Institute of Biblical Research. Danun Institute is actually the name of our other YouTube channel. We're just getting things kicked off there, but if you'd like to join us there for biblical teachings, we do that there as well. And uh, your support is greatly appreciated. IsraeliNewsLive.org. Shalom.